like to say good morning to my brothers and sisters here in the auditorium. And I'd like to say good morning to our brothers and sisters that's on Zoom. We come here together this morning to worship our God in spirit and in truth. It is an honor and a privilege to be here to stand before you this morning. We, I pray that it'd be something that I might say that might cause you to focus in on God and his faithful love for each and every one of us. We're here, God is, is amongst us also. He's on the map of God and sitting in heaven with us in our worship service. Let us all pray. Heavenly Father, I humbly approach your throne of grace. Thank you for the many countless blessings you have given each and every one of us. We pray that as we go into this, continue into the worship service, it will be free and acceptable to you. Pray it be something I might say that might encourage someone to look to you, hold on to you more tightly. This is our prayer in Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of things that's going on in the world. A lot of problems and a lot of changes that are taking place. You know, a lot of them are pretty disturbing. A lot of things that are changing are changing for the best. You know, with these changes that we are going through, it is good to focus on who God is. It is good to focus on his love and his faithfulness to us. To hold on to God, I know most of you, and I know myself personally, come up with different passages that, that I hold on to to help me through my time. In my times that I, I, I look at some scriptures, we have a couple of them that I'm going to share with you, and I know you probably have your own passages that you hold on to yourself. My first one that I hold on to is Psalms 23. And we all know this, but we're going to go through these sets of passages. You can follow along with me. And you can they can be your own or they can already be your own. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is confident words from God, knowing that he will take care of all of our needs and he will be our great shepherd to guide us through this life. We could count on him to be with us in our lives as we go through the different stages and different struggles. I always like the passage that's in Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18 through 20. And this is, this is Jesus talking to the disciples before he went up to heaven. That's Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus said, and Jesus came to them and spoke, saying, All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of age. It is good to know that Jesus has all the authority on heaven and earth. It is good to know that we as disciples follow him and follow his word. It is a great opportunity and a great privilege to be able to serve him as being his disciple. And we must remember that he's always, always with us even to the very end of the ages. That's a promise you can count on. You can count on Jesus being with us as we live our life. Another passage that I look at too, and, and I love this passage, it is found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3. Verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Now, a lot of times we try to do things on our own and sometimes it don't turn out like we want to. 
But God said if we let him direct our path, he will direct it to the way that he wants us to go. He will give us strength and endurance to accomplish everything that he wants us to do in our life. So it is a great privilege and honor to have a God like we have that will direct our path. Another passage that I'd like to, to go over to would be found in Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 3. And the Bible says, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That is some great news right there within itself because God promised that we will have all these spiritual blessings that are in him. Now that means that there are no spiritual blessings outside him. We might have physical blessings, but the spiritual blessings belong solely to God. Well, if you are placed in to Jesus Christ, you have these spiritual blessings. So it is a, it's a great privilege to be able to be placed in Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading today was taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. This is going to go along with what I was mentioning of, uh, about the spiritual blessings that are in Jesus Christ. Now all of us who have put on Jesus Christ were baptized in him into the body. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As we are Christian, great things take place as we live a Christian life. The name of this lesson, if you want to put a title on the lesson, would be, you are a new creation. You are a new creation. These changes take places because it says in our, in our passage, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and old things have passed away, and all things become new. What does, what does this change mean? What position does a new creation hold in the eyes of God? What type of life is he or she should lead? How does this change affect his or her relationships pertaining to the things of one's whole way of life? In the epistle of Paul uh, to the Ephesians, we find the answer to these questions. First of all, a Christian is, desired, is, is described as sitting in the heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter 2, please turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to do in a little time in Ephesians chapter 2. It says in verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. There that word go again, in Christ. In Christ. So it is important to be in Christ, to be this new creation where God can work with you. And in, in, our, in our former condition, we were dead in sin. Look at Verse 1, and he made, and, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. So he made us alive as we are placed in Jesus Christ. So when we were our former self, when we were walking, following after the world, we was dead in sin. When we was walking and following after Satan, we was dead in sin. When we was walking and following after the flesh, we we're dead in sin. You have to remember that. So look at our current condition that we are in now since we are the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, I mean, sorry, chapter 2, 5 and 4 and 5. It says, But who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he hath loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And also, let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. And it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would dare, even dare to die. 
But God demonstrates his love, his own love for us, that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it's important to realize that Christ died for the sinners. And it, it is important to know that Christ, our, our Lord and Savior, makes it possible for us to be placed in that heavenly realm. So now we are blessed to be in the heavenly realms, blessed of uh, being placed with Jesus Christ. And we are seated in right beside Jesus Christ, spiritually speaking. And he's overseeing us, but we have to let him. So our definition of heavenly places is existing where God is. It's the things that takes place in heaven. It's in the heavenly region. So our worship service, even though we are physically here, our worship service is bringing up to God to smell like a sweet fragrance. So it's important that we understand that when we present ourselves to God, God is able to be with us and to uplift us and to uh, guide us in our life. And in our worship service also, you know, one laundry, uh, let him guide us. In the physical realm, in the spiritual realm, it's a contrast. We have the physical things and we have the spiritual things. So it says that being a new creation, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave or free man. Christ makes each man new and give him access to approach into the chamber of God. This new man has access to God through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. He is the mediator and he says that no man comes to the Father but by me, John chapter 14, verse 6. When a person has been washed and cleansed through baptism, the angels in heaven rejoice. The Holy Spirit introduced the new man in the courts of heaven. He does not ask Peter for the privilege. He does not consult the saints. He does not ask the mother of Jesus to invite you. There is only one mediator between God and men, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father also rejoices with the angels in heaven, and he welcomes the new man in his presence. Come on in, you're my son, my you're my son, my son, Jesus recognized you as being a child of mine. Come on in. So with the presence of God, we can enjoy the uh, spiritual realm and we can enjoy the spiritual blessings in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. In the spiritual realm, Jesus rules at God's right hand. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. In the spiritual realm, we sit with Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. In the spiritual realm, principalities and powers of God's wisdom is presented by the church. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. Compare our position in Christ in the heavenly places. Well, I mentioned we are seated at the right hand of God. We are seated together with Christ. Our position with Christ certainly warrants our proper frame of mind. Let's go to Ephesians or Colossians chapter 3 and verse 3, uh, 1 to 2. Colossians chapter 3. One and two. Then, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on the earth things. So, as we seek God, we look for those things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We put in the motion that seek is to put in motion our thoughts and our, our efforts. It's like I had mentioned earlier about my passages that I, I love to reflect on when I'm on trouble. Those are things that God presented to us that we can reflect on through his word. We can get the strength and endurance to pass the time way and know that God will answer our prayers. So being a new creation, we are sitting in the heavenly places and we ought to think about those things. And it also means that we should behave in the same and the like manner. We should be walking in the matter of our calling. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, as a prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of your calling which you were called, 
So it is encouraged us to walk in this way that we were called. He encourages us to be guided by him and we can feel comfortable knowing that God is leading us. Trust in the Lord with all your ways and all your cares. He will set your path free. The purpose of our calling is found in Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 4. To be holy without blame. The purpose of our calling is to be his beloved children through adoption. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5. As we walk worthy of our calling, we walk in love. Ephesians chapter 5. Let's turn there. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us as an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So we walk in a worthy manner, present ourselves to God as the adopted children. We walk worthy of our calling, and we follow Christ's own examples of how we live. And we walk as children in the light. We live our life as in the light, exposing what is not in the light, which is the opposite of the darkness. Darkness is opposite of light, so we expose whatever is going on, the deeds of which might prohibit us from walking in the way that God wants us to walk. We can find that in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 15 through 17. The Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, but the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what is the will of the Lord. So we understand that the times are short, the times of evil, and the time of the Lord is prevailing in our lives as we walk according to our calling. Also, as we walk in are going to happen in our lives and we need to hold fast to God's love for this life. Go to, go to, to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 and the Bible says yes and all who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Sometimes there's a Christian we walk in a way that people don't like what we're doing or what might not like what we say sometimes because we are just living the way that God wants to live. It's a lot of things that's going on in the world right now that's um, contrary to God's word, I put that way. And we might stand out because of what we stand for. It's not that we're against the whole bunch of things, but we're standing by what God wants us to do in our life. And we can read the script, find out what God wants us to do. The Bible is the mind of God revealed to men in written form. Whatever you need to know about God, you go to the Bible and you find out what he, his do's and his don'ts. If it says don't do that, that means don't do it. If it says you can do this, do that. Now, there's some things that we have to make a decision on, but we must trust that God will guide us in our decisions in our life as we trust in him. So we more or less not bucking the trend of mankind, but we're just standing in the path of Jesus Christ which guides us in our life. So that's very important. So we have to stand firm in our battle and stand firm in our, our way. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. And the Bible says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and have done all to stand. That's very important just to stand. The nature of our battle, as we get engaged in this warfare, Ephesians chapter 12, but we do not wrestle with against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So all of this is what our battle is, but we need to stand firm. So our battle is actually in the spiritual realm, as we as point out. So, so all the things that we previously talked about in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3, as we actively walk in, that, or in the way of the world and as we actively walk after Satan and actively walk after the flesh, 
we must be aware of those things. But as we wear the armor of God, he will help us and protect us. Now you must remember that this armor is God's armor. It's not our armor. Our armor will melt and burn away and be dissolved. We can't stand Satan by ourselves. We need to hold on to God and be strong in his power and in his might. It says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in his power. In his power, not our power, in God's power. The nature of our armor is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 13. But we are given this armor to put on. And like I said, it's God's armor. It's not our armor. It's that spiritual armor that we need. This armor is adequate for a strong defensive battle. Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 6, 14 through 18. The waist is girded with truth. The, the breastplate is of righteousness. Our feet is trod with preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. The helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit and the word of God. So we must always pray with all prayer and supplication. This implies that we must be committed and standing firm against the enemy. And so that to retreat is a defeat. It tells us stand firm. So what we must let God fight our battle, battles. We fight God our battles with God's word. In conclusion of this lesson, remember when a person become a new creation, it affects how he sits, stands, and walks. He, he's sitting with Christ in the heavenly places. He's walking in a manner worthy of his calling. He's standing firm in battle. Let's compare this to the wicked person that's in Psalms chapter 1, and verse 1 and 2. The wicked person is walking in the counsel of the wicked. He's standing in the path of the sinner. He's sitting in the seat of the scorpion. That's a great contrast of what's happening right there. Light, day. Night and day. We can see that. So as the old thing pass away, the new things come. If you are a Christian, this should be true in your life, that all things have become new and old have passed away. It's a process that we go through. It just don't happen like this. So we must remember that's a process. Let me give you a quick story. There was a farmer. He was clearing out his field of these old trees to plant new trees. So he cut down all these old trees and he sacked up the wood for firewood and he was going to sell all these trees. So people was coming by and buying the wood. And a young man came by and he asked the farmer, he said, how much for that piece of wood? And the farmer said, for that old ugly stump, it's not worth nothing. It, it won't burn. You can't get much wood out of it. Uh, you can take it. You can have it. So the young man took the stump. He took it home, started working on it, started chiseling, started sawing and cutting, started chiseling, sanding. He did it for about a month. A month later, a beautiful eagle was presented. Beautiful eagle. The young man took that eagle and put it in his art gallery. And one day, that farmer walked into that art gallery. He seen that eagle and immediately said, wow, look at that eagle. It's beautiful. I got to have that eagle. So the farmer said, how much you want for that eagle? And he said, well, I worked real hard on it. I'll give it to you for $500. The farmer said, yes, I got a prize here. Realizing that was the old stump that he gave the young man. The, the artist seen in that old, dirty, raggedy stump something that the former didn't see. God does the same with us. He sees in us what he can make out of us if we let him. We have to remember that. So we become a new creation in his eyes. God can work with us. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it talks about we are workmanship created to do good works. God creates this for us. We must remember that. If you're not a Christian, if you're not born into Jesus' body, you have a chance to be like that eagle 
that old, you know that old, I don't want to talk about nobody because I don't want to offend nobody. <laughs> People are so sensitive these days, so I'm going to be careful. Anyway, that's God's word. The old stuff it talks about in the Bible, and this is Bible, it's your old dirty rags. Sorry. That's what it says. But anyway, he takes the old dirty rags and he can make something beautiful out of it. He changed. It's a transformation that happened, but you have to let it happen. And the way you have that happen is you have to hear the word of God. You have to believe that. You have to uh, confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to repent of your sin, turn away from where you was walking and turn to God. And then you'll be baptized and washed. You won't be that old stump or that dirty rag. You become a new creation in Christ. And then you have to walk faithfully after being baptized. The lesson is yours. If, any, if you have any prayer requests, you can make it known. If you want to be baptized, just make it known to us, and we can do that too. That's my lesson this morning. I thank you for your attention. I hope something that I said that will encourage you to walk in a way that's worthy of your calling. Amen.